nice crowd. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Shelley Power, and I am thrilled to be here. And thank you so much for sharing this moment with us. This is a culmination for us um, before the book came out, um, when the New York Times article uh, sprung up. We were just so excited to hear about these five pioneering ballerinas. And so I'm going to make sure that I'm not giving you feedback. Um, but first, I'd like to just have everyone introduce themselves. We'll start off with that. I'm Carlia Shelton Benjamin. Sheila Rohan. My name is Hadija Tarion McKinney Griffith, representing my mother, Gail McKinney Griffith. Hmm. I'm Marcia Sells. Lydia Abarker Mitchell. And I'm Karen Valvey, our author. Big round of applause. <laughs> and I'm just going to ask to take 10 seconds for you to close your eyes, and we're going to hold space for our fifth pioneering ballerina, Gail, who is not with us, that was with us at our big gala, so we did get to celebrate her. But her beautiful daughter is here. And let's just take and let her enter the space with us. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. She was very, very special, and you're going to learn a lot about that. So when we were standing backstage, um, Lydia, I think you were handing these out because we thought it might be hot, but I really know why. It's because I think there may be a few tears through this conversation because it is a very emotional book. Here we go. So Carol, why don't you start and tell us a little bit. I want you to set the stage and how this all came about and maybe what you learned from your interviews that surprised you. Maybe start there. Um, you know, it's funny, in talking about the book, these are five women who helped build Dance Theatre of Harlem. Dance Theatre of Harlem is synonymous with Arthur Mitchell, who was a visionary, um, who, who launched DTH after Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, because he believed that art was activism. But when I think about the book, and when I think about my interviews with the women, um, this is, this is really a story about um, mothers in so many ways. Um, Carlia's mother in Colorado, who when her daughter would say, I'm going to be a ballerina, and Jean Shelton thought, there's absolutely no way. There's no space in this country for a black ballerina, but I'm going to let her go her own road. I'm going to let her make her own journey. Sheila Rohan, who's the youngest of eight, her father died when she was one, and her West Indian immigrant mother raised eight girls. She loved the Brooklyn Dodgers, not ballet. <laughs> <laughs> and Sheila said it was probably lucky that she never met Arthur Mitchell, because if your mother ever heard Arthur Mitchell talk disrespectfully to any of these women, she would let him have it. Marcia Sells um, was a snowflake in the Nutcracker as a child, and her mother, Mamie, heard a white girl in the audience say, I've never seen a black snowflake. And Mamie turned around and said, you've never seen candy dance either. <laughs> <laughs> and Lydia Abarca, um, her mother Josephine worried when Lydia at 17 quit her bank job because she met Arthur Mitchell. And Arthur Mitchell took one look at her feet and one look at this beauty and said, I'll give you $150 if you quit your job. And Josephine worried that this was an impractical choice, but understood that her daughter was a star. And finally, and this is where I'm probably going to start crying, but Hadija, um, who really, truly is holding such loving space for her mother, Gail. Yeah, I can't even look at her, because she's just She's just a glow. She glows with Gail's energy and grace and the love that Gail showed her as a child and as a young dancer and as a woman just pours off of her. So um, to their mothers, this book is hopefully honoring them. And also, I hope to be honoring my two daughters 
who are um, on the adoptive mother of two black girls who are dancers themselves. This book is a love letter to them, and I hope they feel connected um, by the power of tradition and community that, that these women represent. So that's all I got. It's <laughs> a hard act to follow, but Hadija, I want you to start and just tell everyone what you're doing now and a little bit about the last six months of your life. Oh my goodness, yes. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I was my mother's caregiver, um, and we had a, a quick change of events um, where I was so graciously invited into the, the company of the Swans and Karen and Pantheon. Um, as you may or may not know, they had been meeting through Zoom calls since 2020 in the pandemic, and everyone is placed throughout the US. Um, so this is how everyone can come together. And uh, my mother was the secretary of the 152nd Street ba Black Ballet Legacy. And um, as her, her health deteriorated, it's almost like a stack of books, just watching, 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 and I stepped in. I was a performer in New York and um, went to Connecticut to care for her and decided that I would um, from one of my the ballet companies that one of the ballet companies that I was dancing with um, Independently we went around a circle. It's a, a queer ballet company and uh, everyone was introducing themselves and someone said and I am a, a dancer as well as a transition doula and I had never heard that before um, So I, I knew my mother was very proud when her mother Millicent McKinney passed at the age of 101 mm -hmm. I called my, my ballet friend and, and asked her to support us through this transition. And I, my mother was so proud of that, that I knew that I had to take my, my courage and step into understanding this. So I enrolled in a course um, to get certified. That wasn't my, my, the point of it, but it's to walk alongside my mother as closely as I could until she transitioned and the sun shone immediately as that happened. So that was a lot of my um, experience. And um, now I'm, I'm back in New York, in Brooklyn where I live. Um, seems like a transition in trying to get my, my grounding and my rooting and trying to understand and listen to where life is gonna take me and where maybe my mother will also guide me. So in, in August, on my birthday, which is August 13th, my sister, as I stand with this sistership, will, the baby will decide what day they are going to come. But my, my close friend will be giving birth. Her due date is my birthday. Mm -hmm. And I will step into a role of, of supporting her as her birth partner. So there's a lot, nice. a lot to listen to, I think. I have a happening. feeling uh, Gail's essence is within you right so. there. Would you all agree? I think so. Absolutely. Because yeah. Gail was our caregiver. She was. Wow. She's ballet mistress. But she held us together. The, the care that Khadija did for her mom was priceless. We were blessed to be able to see Gail before she transitioned. And it was just wonderful to watch and to see and to feel. Thank you. And it was wonderful to have you there. Thank you Beautiful. so much. Well, maybe you can speak. I'd like to go down the line and maybe talk a little bit about what your lives were like as dancers. What did you eat? How many hours, <laughs> How many hours did you sleep? What did you do for solace? What did you do to relieve your stress while you were dancing? Do you want to start? What was your day like? Where did you live? OK. Uh, when I first got to New York, I lived at the Webster Apartments, which is where uh, many newbies come from all over to, to live in New York. It's a women's residence. Um, and there was lots of company because there were other dancers, so we'd all take the train together and we'd all come back together. Um, the day, the day started when I was an apprentice, the day started with Pilates uh, mat work. Nice way to start the day. <laughs> uh, and then we had company class from 10 to 12, I think 12.30. We could go over. 
Then we had a little break, and then rehearsal was from one to four. Then as an apprentice, you had class. You had to take another class from four to six. Then after that, you had uh, another rehearsal from six to eight. But if you were performing, then you had you know, the class in the morning, rehearsals all day. You did get a little bit more of a break, come back and perform, uh, wait, perform, come back for company warm up, then perform, and then that was it. <laughs> so, so they were long days. Did you have much time for sleep? <laughs> um, I managed. How did, you, <laughs> how did you take care of yourself? Well, um, I have to say, I had, I had children at the time that I was dancing. So how did I take care of them? Well, you know, I, I got into wellness, hmm. yoga, meditation. Um, yes, just trying to understand our bodies and how to take care of ourselves. Um, nothing spectacular, nothing expensive, <laughs> um, but, you know, just basically how to take care of yourself, how to really stretch and exercise, when to know it's time to sit down, even though it's, um, there's a lot going on, because even after rehearsal, I'm running home, and then there's children, and getting ready for school the next day, and, but how to pace yourself. Didn't always work, but, <laughs> but it was, you know, it was something to work on, something to work towards, and uh, it helped me. You didn't it, have very many resources, so you were doing this all on your own. It wasn't like you had a nutritionist there and no, you had your no, yoga no. teacher, and no, maybe no. talk about what you did. Right. I, don't, I mean, in those days, nobody was talking in terms of the nutrition and things like that, and when I moved here, to New York City, I moved and, and um, well, also went to professional children's school, which many of the dancers of Dance of Harlem and young people from Juilliard and SAB also went to. So I also had to get used to leaving Cincinnati, Ohio, where, you know, a very regimented uh, school life, and um, suddenly <laughs> I remember walking into PCS and they were, so what's your rehearsal schedule like? On which then my academic schedule would be based. That would never have happened in Cincinnati. So then I had to adjust to that and also um, to, to a family that I didn't know very well, although the woman, Debbie Bernardo, who also came, was at the University of Cincinnati and whose uncle's home I was able to move into and live and that my parents, they were in Brooklyn. So I had to master the New York City subway system um, as opposed to my mom or a carpool taking me to school. And then, um, and what all it meant, you know, when you're used to your mom uh, making your breakfast and your lunch, yeah, it was that kind of, I mean, it's the Midwest, this is what kids did. Um, suddenly it's, no, it's you, you're, the, you're the person who has to do all of that. And at manage, 16. Right, at, and manage the schedule of like, because then it's like, just as Ducky, you have to get to class, you have to be there for rehearsal, and sometimes my, um, what was supposed to be in those days called correspondence, so it was just me and an individual teacher, would run a little over and I'm like, oh my gosh, thankfully the D and the A train run express from 59th Street all the way up to 125th, and then the next stop is 145th, and you walk to DTH, but managing that, then the other class, and then, for me, it was homework to do that because the one thing my mother always said, if those grades start going down, I may come visit you. I was like, well, <laughs> you can't do that. I have a contract. <laughs> you heard how my mother responded to somebody. So it was uh, trying to navigate all that, and that was pretty much it. And, you know, in terms of trying to eat right, although I have to say that's when I discovered coffee. <laughs> um, here when I when I got to New York, um, which made my mother a tea drinker very unhappy, but um, trying to navigate that and make sure that, um, you know, I was still able to do the work. Lydia. I was lucky. I'm a, I was born and raised in New York, and I'm the oldest of seven. 
Um, Juilliard used to be right around the corner. This is way before Lincoln Center was built. So uh, when a teacher advised my mom to get me formal training, I was lucky. I just walked up the street and got a full scholarship. And um, I could walk to rehearsals, actually, um, take the bus. I mean, it was nothing for me. I, I lived in New York. But um, having younger siblings and coming home after rehearsals and classes, uh, Lydia, it's your turn to do the dishes, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so much Pretty for being a ballerina. <laughs> yeah. you, had, you had to pull your weight at home, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, can I say something really quickly about Lydia? Of course. Um, Lydia was Dance Theater of Harlem's first prima ballerina. And a nun choreographed a little number to Waltz of the Flowers at her, at her school when she was in the fourth grade and was so wowed by her that this nun said to her mother, this girl needs training. And that's how she ended up at Juilliard and spent years there getting what should be the best training there is for a young ballerina and was never given a chance to perform. Was never shown a stage, never went to the ballet. It was, she quit dancing, why wouldn't you? It was luck that her sister said, there's a black guy at, the, at, at Harlem School of the Arts who's holding auditions, why don't, or holding classes, why don't you go down there? We that's, almost that's lost a her as a dancer. Because I was just going to ask, mm -hmm. you, you had this life training to be ballet dancers, but how do you, where did you see dancers like yourself, or didn't you? And how, did you, how were you invited into that space? And I then we will certainly be talking about Mr. Mitchell. Yeah, I was lucky because, uh, like uh, Karen said, my sister was taking violin, and I had quit ballet because I didn't know where it was going. I was not exposed to Nutcracker, you know, other than what the, net, the nun did. I didn't get it. I, I grew up with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. I lived down the street from the Apollo Motown. So ballet was disappointing to me. I thought we were going to learn how to dance, you know. <laughs> but when they told me to hold on to this wooden thing on the wall and bend my knees and, <laughs> When are we going to dance? When are we going to dance? But I, I stuck it out uh, four years there and then two years at Harkness. And um, I lost my scholarship because Jamie Rogers, who is of the short Puerto Rican in the original West Side Story movie, had a jazz class going on across the hall. And I started sneaking in there. And I loved it. I mean, we were dancing. They had drums. And they sat me down, your scholarship is for ballet. And I just said, see ya. But I had a normal two, my last two years in high school, junior, senior year. And then that summer when I graduated, my sister mentioned this, this black man's going to be teaching uh, ballet. I've never had a black ballet teacher before. Maybe he'll make it relatable. I don't get it. And it was Arthur Mitchell. And he made me go to New York City Ballet to see him perform, <laughs> and I was hooked. I said, this, this is what I've been working yes. on. So. What about you, Mark? Well, I am, so as the baby, I got to see Lydia and Gail and Sheila when they came to Cincinnati, and when I was the only, I mean, I started ballet at four, and fortunate my mother was very much into the arts, but. I was the only black girl in my ballet school and for a long time. So they're, you know, turning nine years old and here comes Dance Theater of Harlem, actually in my hometown, and I could see, okay, there is where I could actually go. I mean, I wasn't even thinking that Cincinnati Ballet was going to um, take me in. They did but I could see that future and I started going to the summer intensive. So I am fortunate that I could see as the person that here's an opportunity of what is ballet and it was black ballerinas on point and doing these amazing ballets. They were doing both Lewis Johnson's work and Arthur Mitchell's work, Rhythmatron and Balanchine's work, Concerto Barocco. So I, it, that was, that I was fortunate, I could see that. Um, as you opposed see to the, the right. juxtaposition of 
seeing it and not mm. seeing yes. it. Mm -hmm. what yes. What about for your mom? Did she ever s share those stories of how oh. she started? Oh my goodness. Well, of how she started, yeah. I think she was in New York in Harlem where she was born and she started dancing at Carnegie Hall for, for classes. And then I think when she was about five, she went to Connecticut because her father got a job and missed dancing and so was dancing at a local school. And I think she knew that she wasn't alone. I don't think she held that story, but she physically was in the spaces that she was in. And I remember it's also held in the book that when told to partner with someone, mm -hmm. she sees the, the partner flinch and you know to really feel alienated and to really feel othered. So I, I know that she knew that they were beautiful dancers that had come before her, but she really had to dig into that inner strength to really get her there. And when she went to Juilliard, um, she experienced sort of the same, the same um, pushback in when she wanted to declare her major, maybe modern dance is a better route for you, right? And, and not being allowed to, to stand in her power as a, as a, as a ballerina, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so as she's crying and, and heartbroken, she's told about an audition that's happening and to, to get yourself up and get your shoes on and, and go and dance and to enter a room full of dancers of, of color, of, of so many beautiful shades and talents. And um, I think that really spoke to her. She, was, she has arrived. Thank you. Sheila, how about you? Well, I, myself, I did know of other black ballerinas and dancers. Um, just looking up the history of dance and whatnot. I was aware, but I didn't think for myself that I, I guess, had what it takes to be a ballerina. Um, I, I didn't audition for any uh, classical ballet companies, and I didn't have a chance to go to any uh, you know, schools like uh, Juilliard, but I always danced and I loved ballet, but I was doing other things. I did contemporary dance and jazz and African dance and modern. So when I got the chance to go audition for um, Arthur Mitchell, um, I was a little skeptical, but I wanted it. <laughs> <laughs> And I went and I passed the audition, so I'm saying, well, all right, let's see. Let's see what we can do with this, yeah. Uh, for me, I started dancing in Denver, Colorado with the Colorado ba uh, Concert Ballet at that time. I was four years old, uh, first performed Nutcracker. I was a little toy soldier. Um, <laughs> and I grew up through the ranks at that company. Um, was never able to dance Clara in the Nutcracker, never able to do Sugar Plum, um, even though I was more than capable of doing it. Um, there was a woman that came to, to Denver and she um, was teaching at the, at the company and she said, so what are you gonna do with, your, with dancing? What do you plan to do? And um, I said, well, I'm gonna be a professional and she said, well, it's almost too late. I think I was 17. She said, it's almost too late. <laughs> so she arranged for about seven of us to go to New York, and she arranged auditions for us. Right before we left, the dance magazine with Dance Theater of Harlem came out, and Lydia was on the cover. And I'd never seen a black ballerina before. Mm. And I opened the the dance magazine and there's Virginia Johnson and Gail McKinney. And I asked her, I said, could you please get me an audition with this company? Well, she knew Violette Verdi, who knew Arthur Mitchell, and they got me an audition. I auditioned with the company on stage during their season at what was then the Eurus Theater. And it was just amazing to be on stage with all of these black ballerinas and danseurs um, at the end of the, the class, Arthur Mitchell told me to go and put my point shoes on. So I went backstage and was putting on my point shoes and there was Gail and Susan Lavelle and they were dyeing their point shoes skin color. 
and that did it for me. I said, I'm home, <laughs> I'm staying here. <laughs> so setting the stage of the time that Mr. Mitchell started Dance Theater of Harlem, this is during the civil rights. And he was going to go to Brazil, I believe, yeah, he was. and yeah. to form a company there. But then he decided to stay in Harlem and start this company mm -hmm. up. And so one of the things that, Karen, you wrote as a quote, if I could quote you here, is art is activism. Let the gorgeous line of his dancers' bodies serve as fists in the air. And I'm just curious about how much of his vision was activism through your experience, and how much of it was artistic? And how did he put those two things together? That's a killer question. <laughs> <laughs> You've been designated. <laughs> well, the act of doing the art, you see, that's the activism. Mm. He, um, he spoke to us at length about the importance of who we are and what we were doing. It wasn't just a ballet um, company so that we can look nice in our tutus and uh, prove something. It was, we were part of the movement. You see that we should be allowed to do this art form as much as anyone else, that there was really no holdback other than people's minds and, and intent. That um, he wanted us to feel like ambassadors going forward and that we had to be the very best, really be on our game. Um, and that was our, um, our part of this being um, the civil rights movement. Thank, thank you for that. That was a really important statement, I think, in this book that really launches it. So we've talked about your dancing, what it was like in your life. Um, I will talk about Mr. Mitchell and your experience with him. But you especially, Lydia, were a muse to him. <laughs> and there, there's one thing to be a muse, and there's another thing to be your own artist. So maybe kind of talk about that, and I'm sure all of you were muses at one point when you're learning a role, um, or that he's choreographing on you, or this choreographer. But there's also a moment where you have to be your own artist to bring that in and separate that person utilizing you as their tool and you becoming the artist. Yeah. I, he had a clean slate with me. I had no preconceived ideas of what ballet should be. I, I was learning as I was going along. I didn't have a role model. I had to figure that one out myself. Mm -hmm. um, balancing ballets for me have an element of jazz. So it, 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 just clicked. I, it clicked. I, I loved balancing ballets. And he was the perfect person to fine tune that. But I also love jazz, and I did leave the company for a short time to do Bubba and Brown Sugar with Cab Calloway, believe it or not. Yeah, and then I went to Europe and did it um, with Vivian Reed. For a few months, um, I came back. I did uh, Swan Lake, you know, and we, we kind of parted ways. I, I wanted to be a star. I wanted to make enough money to buy my parents a home to get them out of the projects, and it never happened. So, um, I did Bob Fosse's dancing on Broadway, and I hurt my knee, and that was it. Yeah. My second act started, <laughs> but I've always known these ladies, and we've been there for each other throughout 50 years of friendship. <laughs> And that's how you get through leaving Dance Theater Harlem and doing something else and then finding yourselves right back together and remembering all of the wonderful things and all of the horrible things. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets really juicy. But I, wanted, oh, no. but I do think that 
I mean, this is one of the challenges for art, period. I mean, I think within dance, with the, and particularly within ballet, dance has not always gotten the kind of money. Um, and, and even now, I mean, <laughs> you know, as you run a don't dance company, as you run a dance company, I mean, it is a it is a challenge. We don't make that, and so it's, you know, even in the idea of being a star, and there are ballerinas whose names we know, but if we talk about what money and things that they have at the end of it, unlike athletes, basketball players, uh, or even individual star tennis players, it's just not the same kind of financial. It is It is truly about the love of it, but that's sometimes the, the hard part. Even when you make stardom, the financial part of it isn't always there. And that's, and that's something that sometimes you know, but you don't um, realize afterwards, what's gonna happen afterwards. And it really should be, because we train just as hard as... Mm -hmm. Oh, harder. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, harder. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. We it's don't fill stadiums, that's the problem. Yeah. We're yeah. not a commodity. I wonder if we could, though. <laughs> we were never given the chance. <laughs> that, may be, that, may be, that may be the next... Uh, what about you, Jay? <laughs> in terms of, in terms well, of we kind of we kind of oh. transition well, from I being mean, a muse mm -hmm. and being an artist into kind of transitioning out of being mm -hmm. in the dance world. We kind of follow that sequence. Yeah, after dance theater in Harlem, I all, I continued to dance. It wasn't maybe not all not always classical, but I did uh, perform with Lewis Johnson and, and other companies. So, but oh no, I never made any money, you know. <laughs> you know, and then even teaching class, you were lucky if you got twenty-five dollars for the class at that time. Now we're talking seventies and eighties, where um, so. I don't know. Does that answer your question? <laughs> well, I'm gonna say something about you, Tim. Okay. Um, I feel like uh, what I'm not hearing is. And this is because I think dancers have this way of putting themselves aside when they have oh. someone creating <laughs> something on them. And I ask each of you about being a muse. And you really couldn't get to that because you were, you were thinking about all of the hard work you did and all of that, but not truly what you provided for Mr. Mitchell because humility was so drilled into them yes. by him. And that weight of being an ambassador, that puts the mission before the artist. But yes. it's also the weight of, of, of dancers, period. Correct. When you yes. think choreo you, are the, you are the muse, the tool, the canvas. instrument, the canvas for a choreographer. It is not, I mean, you're not usually having a conversation of like, no, I'd rather put my foot here or I'd rather be on this <laughs> side. That just doesn't happen. And you learn that, honestly, day one, even when you're taking class. I mean, you don't get to decide what your combinations are gonna be. You do <laughs> the combinations that are at given your at your told. So it is, you're right, in that sense of the psychology of it, you really are, um, so much thinking of yourself as the person who, not so much quote the creator, although when you think about it, it's like even in terms of timing, once you get the technique, you're the person who will like really sell the work. Like if you see, had seen Lydia do Bugaku, it doesn't look like Bugaku when that Suzanne Farrell did. She truly would put her stamp on it. If you saw, you know, Carly doing grad ball. These are ballets that have been around, but the way Dancer of Harlem or the way a dancer would do it, it's very distinctly different. So he allowed that different. artistry to come out. Yeah, and especially, I think when you were doing an acting role, um, I know that uh, I was lucky to do Equus, and I was uh, the stable girl. So there, there's, you, they give you the steps, but then there's a story that you have to tell. You have to say what you're doing when you're doing those steps, which required me to write a story so that I knew which, what each movement meant, or as I moved to that side of the stage, what I was saying and the, wanted the audience to know. So there is that. Shelley, really quickly also, yes, they were muses, they were a canvas, they were instruments in their first act. 
when they got together for their third act, it's because they decided they were ready to tell their story. They formed the Legacy Council. They were not muses. They are not talking about Arthur Mitchell's journey. They're talking about their journeys. And humility has to be set aside to say, I have a story to tell. But this is what, what you're witnessing right now is exactly what Karen would do to us when we would get in this conversation and we weren't, just as you picked up, picking up that moment where we were letting, in some ways, humility or shyness or sometimes that stepping out of that role mm -hmm. get in the way of sharing that story. And, and that has also been the beauty of, you know, the, the coming together and how this book comes out, I mean. Yeah, I, I, I want to get to the Legacy Council, but we, I think we have to talk about Mr. Mitchell first. Oh, we? Yeah. <laughs> he was kind of part of Dance Theater of Harlem, I believe, yeah. um, and certainly had quite the impact on your lives, on your human spirit, on who you were to, and who you are today. Um, but throughout the book, let's be honest, a lot of you had difficulties with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then you ended up having full circle, which we won't give everything away. But maybe talk about the difficulties that, I mean, Mr. Mitchell had quite a job to do. Starting up a, a ballet company in Harlem, um, having to raise the funds and be the artistic director. Um, so he did both of those. And then he was in the studio 24 seven, choreographing and then mm -hmm. um, traveling and touring and all of that. But he was rather difficult, and you talk about, in this book, Karen shares the pain that you did go through. And I think it's only fair to share a little bit about that and to know there was recovery, as you can see. <laughs> but go that's ahead. how the sisterhood came together. We, what he was doing was too important. And those people who couldn't take the criticism or the harshness left. And those of us who really, really wanted to do this, it was, we had to do it. We were ambassadors. We had each other to vent, you know. Sometimes your, your parents are hard on you and then you look back years later and you say, I get it now, you know, I really appreciate it. But when you're there, it, it's, it's hard. But what he, was, what he was teaching us, what he was drilling into us, the work ethic and the discipline and, that's not good enough, you have to do it better. It was hard to hear that, but it Would could like get to, to be. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, yeah, but <laughs> 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 there was a point, you reach a point where you just can't anymore, and that's yes. where I was. I don't want to give everything away, but there is a moment when um, I just said, that's it. And I walked out of the rehearsal. I walked out of the building. Mm -hmm. When I walked out, sorry, <laughs> the clouds parted and there were birds with ribbons around <laughs> <laughs> And it was, um, <laughs> It was life-saving for me. I mean, I, it saved my spirit, you know. And it was hard. It was hard to make that transition away from those people that I'd been with and who nurtured me and, and who I loved. Um, you were saving yourself. I had to. Yeah. I Sheila, had to. what about yeah. you? Mr. Mitchell was very difficult. Um, we tried to deal with him as best we could, because we wanted to do this. But he could be really mean, not just for the corrections that he gave you and the ballets and stuff. Sometimes he was just mean. And um, I always, not so much to me, uh, he didn't pick on me too much maybe because I was a mother, I don't know. But um, we would go to Gale because she was ballet mistress. And we would cry on Gail's shoulder, poor thing. And then she would have to go back to him and try to negotiate and try to manipulate, you know. So she really was, that's why, well, one reason 
why uh, we love her so. She also gave because. you a ritual, a very special gift that you did before performances. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> which was a prayer. Yes. And can you just talk about that quickly? And I've been given the five minutes because we have, I, I really mm -hmm. want, yes, I know we could wow. be here for two days. Um, um, but to talk about, I really want you to talk about the Legacy Council and what that has done for your lives because I think, I know I see some dancers out there and I think it's so important that you came together to celebrate who you are and what you had been through and to heal because there's so many of their personal stories in this book mm -hmm. that takes you through, through the transition of who they are today and how ballet affected you. So um, perhaps you could talk a little bit about the Legacy Council. Uh, the prayer was a ritual which I think was just beautiful, that, beautiful and funny all at the same time, <laughs> um, and uh, that you, you took with you. But maybe just describe the Legacy Council very quickly and what it's given to you in your life. Who wants to do During that? During the pandemic, we were all stuck at home, and we started exploring Zoom calls mm -hmm. and seeing each other. She's in Denver. I'm in Atlanta. She's in New, York, New Jersey. Um, the stories started coming yeah, out. Yeah, we talked to a lot of alumni uh, mm -hmm. and just sharing stories and remembering things that we had forgotten or were way back <coughs> there. And uh, we decided that there just wasn't, we weren't anywhere. <laughs> All that work we did and we weren't anywhere. So um, we decided. So when you would ask the women, was I really a principal dancer? Was yeah. it real? Yeah, was it real? To we ask would ask ourselves, question. was it real? We were there, yeah, right? yes, it was real. Yeah. Your children there weren't were even pictures photos. of us at Dance Theater of Harlem. That was, yeah. When you walk through the door, <laughs> there's not even a memory right. of us. They're all in Especially here. Especially, I would say, of Lydia, because she was, she was our diva. And, <laughs> and, and um, people knew her and knew about her, but I, you know, so neglect. But it was a, but it was a in some ways a, a both therapy, yeah. history, and realizing just as we've said, if we didn't do it, then we needed to tell, you know, if we weren't going to do, who was going to tell it, gonna tell that story? That's what we, and it was a sense of because it is so ephemeral, it, that career just sort of happens, and then you're like. Did that, did, 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 did that, that happen? happen? <laughs> did that happen? Because yeah. if the world tells you it didn't, yeah. if the world says first black ballerina, Misty Copeland, she's magnificent, but then how are you supposed to hear that if you were Lydia Barca? Mm -hmm. That the, must have inspired you to write this book, uh, Karen, to, to bring their stories to life. Uh, we're a team. Mm -hmm. They're in charge. I wanted to listen. My daughter um, was bragging that her mom was the first prima ballerina, and um, she couldn't find anything on the internet. Oh, wow. And she said, Mom, everything that came up was Misty Copeland. And we've met her. She's a wonderful dancer. But the history, you know, I said, well, I have some reviews and things down in the basement. <laughs> She's like, wow. So, I mean, we have to tell our stories. And I, I keep saying this, I met a woman, T.J. Moore, she's an author herself, and she told me, if you don't tell your story mm -hmm. and someone else tells it, it becomes mm -hmm. his story. Mm -hmm. So it just came together. And, and Karen came to a Zoom call, and we loved her, and we're telling her all our business and all our <laughs> dirty laundry. <laughs> but it was so healing. It's so healing to be able to do that and laugh. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we can laugh about Mr. Mitchell now. Now, <laughs> now, now. Yeah. And Hadija, that your mother, your mother's words are put down on record. Yes. Thank God. I'm really thankful for that. I'm really thankful for the book that you hold and the stories that you share and continue to collectively share. This was very, when we speak about the pain uh, this was very hard for my mother to, to share, and she would tell me certain stories, but she was not the one to really go back into memory, back and down memory lane. She just always thought, well, 
you know, what, what does it bring you? So when I was watching The Wiz on television, I was like, Mom, look at this. Isn't this incredible? Look, she said, yeah. I was in it, and she walked out the room. <laughs> I go running after her, I'm like, wait, Mom, what do you mean, you're in it? So we go and we look, and I see her. It's my mom, like, she has such a history, and her pictures are around, but thank you so much for holding this story, because timing just so has it. I hold this book so closely to me, and I get to know her as a human, and I get to, to continue to feel encouraged and supported by these beautiful humans Thank you so much. Lovely. I guess my last thing that I would say, unless you have something else I don't, to say about the Legacy Council. Anything more? No. All right. You, you did a lovely thing that you would put post-its up on or little notes, uh, these little power notes that you would give to other dancers. And so, if you were to write one today to mm. yourself, oh, what would it be? Yeah, I tell you, you, I got it. You got it. How would you just pump yourself up? I don't know. <laughs> I, I would have said, hold on a little longer. That would have been my power note. Because I think about, I mean, I've been blessed and fortunate to, to go on and leave and, and have a career past, past ballet. But I probably let it leave my leave a little earlier, because as Kalia said, I was in a moment of like I was saving my spirit. I had a moment in the studio when Mr. Mitchell was like, "Well, is that girl gonna make up her mind?" And I made up my mind, and I walked out the studio. You've um, got to read these stories. <laughs> today. But I Amazing. am blessed that because of all that I went through, I've been able to do a lot of different things, but. That's a I, long po power note. It would, yeah. it would have been, yeah, but it would have been, hold, hold on. on a little longer. Hold on, who else wants to be brave? I'll, I'll be brave. I think my, mine would have been, don't take it personally, just be fierce. Just yeah. be fierce. Yes. You are a star. Yeah. Just go out there and shine. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> and what would your mom have for a power note? Continue with grace and courage and love. That is wonderful. That is this, this is such a lovely story. It really is a lovely story about mothers, as you said, Karen, but for me it was about learning about forgiveness. Yes, dance is the vehicle, but there was forgiveness, there's love, there's family, there's relationships, there's history. I mean, they went through the AIDS epidemic, losing several of dancers that they were with. And they take them, which I, I, you have a lovely saying about holding space for them and their chapter of their lives that I love. I'm not doing it justice. Um, but it, it's, it, it's just amazing the time frame that you went through and where you are today. And we are just so honored to be in your space and to be sharing your incredible stories. So we want to open it up to questions. Um, you know what, Shelly, we are actually at time. Uh, what I think oh. we'll do is oh, no. um, we'll end here and then go upstairs and then folks if you have questions can ask oh, them. Thank you very much.